Pharmacology BSc mini taster lecture session uh, just to let everybody know um, before we kick off with our session this evening that we are recording the session this evening um, we will be sharing that with those who, who couldn't join us um, live so um, but just to note that you um, are not kind of visible cameras are not on um, you're not visible on the call at all um, just but just to make you aware that we're recording um, so a very warm welcome as I say to our mini taste lecture um, session this evening. My name is Kirsty Allen and I'm Head of Student Recruitment and Widening Participation here at St George's and I'll be hosting the session this evening um, and I'll be joined by my colleague Colette who will be manning the Q&A and we really do encourage you to ask as many questions as come to mind either on the content of these fantastic lectures that we have for you this evening or more broadly about what it might be like to study clinical pharmacology here at St George's or what life is like as a student um, here at the university as well. So there will be designated points throughout the session um, where we'll address those questions. We also have um, some student ambassadors on the call as well. You can ask them any questions, um, but we will have points in the call where we'll kind of get to those questions. So please do send them in. Um, so yes, next slide, please, Colette. slide hasn't changed for me yet. Just checking, can you hear me okay, Colette? Yeah, I can hear you. I'm just changing the slide one few second. Perfect. Sorry, everybody, just whilst we have this little slide glitch, but do bear with us and I will take you through what we have coming up in the session shortly. OK, so that should uh, talk you through what we have coming up. So I will give a very brief welcome to St George's, tell you a little bit about us if you haven't visited us before or haven't heard of us before and what to um, expect from the session. And then we will have a taster lecture by Atik, followed by a taster lecture by Selma. Each taster lecture will be about 15 to 20 minutes. And after the lecture, we will give we'll have a couple of minutes just to address any questions that you might have about the content. Um, that our course team covered in their talks. We will then have a student ambassador uh, panel with Diana and Benjamin, who are both studying clinical pharmacology here at St George's. Do send in your questions as we have the panel so we can put those questions to um, our students as well. There'll then, there, there will then be uh, a Q&A, so any other questions that we haven't addressed before I'll talk through next steps. So if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about studying clinical pharmacology here at St George's, what are some things that you can do to find out more um, ahead of applying? Next slide, please. So just to introduce you to St George's, if you haven't heard of us before, so we are the only university in the UK to specialise in healthcare and medicine. And we're, ba we're based in Tooting, South West London, and we share a site with um, St George's Hospital. So the only university um, in the UK to share a site with a major UK uh, teaching hospital as well. So that's something unique about us. Um, some of you may have seen the site already um, on uh, A&E, uh, 24 Hours in A&E, uh, which is a Channel 4 TV show. So possibly you'll have had a little bit of familiarity with the site that way. Um, 
And St George's is home to over five and a half thousand students. And it's a really multidisciplinary environment due to the specialist nature of our institution. So you will be studying alongside lots of other students who are committed to kind of pursuing a career in healthcare, whether that's um, through medicine, allied health or through sciences. Um, lots of lots of yeah different ways. So next slide, please. So yes, this just uh, list goes through our, our undergraduate courses that we offer here at St George's. I do encourage you to, to check out our website to find out more about those. Um, and we'll also talk more about how you can find out more about this course specifically at the end of the session. So we've got a very jam-packed session. So I'm now going to hand over to Atik to start us off with our first taster lecture. So I do hope you enjoy it and keep your questions coming in through the Q&A. Uh, hello everyone. Is everybody able to see my screen and the slides I'm sharing? Kirsty, can you confirm, please? Hi, Atik. So I can see you. And Colette, are you sharing the slides, or Atik, would you be more comfortable to share your screen? I'm happy both ways. I, it looks like I've uh, pressed share, but it, I'm not sure if you can see it. Yeah, we so can I see can't it see your slide. slide. Oh, sorry. I can't see Atik's slides. I'll try again. Let's try again. And uh, yes. You can see it? I can see it now, yep. Perfect. OK, so. Um, welcome everybody uh, to this event. I'm Dr. Atik Hayat and I'm one of the lecturers in drug development, uh, in which is a module that is taught in the clinical pharmacology degree program here at St. George's. Uh, and I'm quite delighted to be talking about a subject that I'm profoundly interested in, which is epigenetics. Um, uh, and it's, it's all about learning about things that is beyond DNA. I'm sure you've already heard a lot about DNA and how important that is for us. But I want to introduce you to an innovative and a contemporary subject called epigenetics. Uh, and hopefully that will give you a taste of what clinical pharmacology is all about if you were to study with us in the future. Now, it's not possible for us to be uh, for us to talk about epigenetics without talking about genetics, um, because each cell in our body contains about 3 billion pairs uh, of, of these nucleotides, the A, T, C, and G. Uh, and to be more precise, actually 3.2 billion pairs of, uh, uh, of these A, T, C, and G. Uh, but one mistake in it can have a life-changing impact in the form of a disease, uh, or which can have a devastating impact on your life and that of your family. Now, in 2001, we, we started to study the genome sequence, which is the order of the DNA that occurs in our cells. Um, and there was some really strong language that, were, that was used by healthcare professionals and even politicians such as Bill Clinton, who was the former US president. He said, today we are learning the language in which God created life. In fact, the chair of the Wellcome Trust, Michael Dexter, uh, he said, who, who contributed much to the genome sequence, he said this is an outstanding achievement in terms of human history. Uh, but we might quibble a little bit with these statements because uh, perhaps fire or the written alphabet has had a bit more of a profound impact on the human condition than the DNA. But nevertheless, it is a big deal. But I'm here to tell you today that that's not all that there is. And this is what brings me to epigenetics. Now, you can have two things that are genetically identical. By that, we mean that their genetic code is exactly the same. The A, T, C, G, and the order in which it occurs is exactly the same. And we can really easily do that in laboratories. So you can take two mice and inbreed them over and over again. And after a few generations, you will find that their genetic code is exactly the same. 
And of course, you can also keep them in the same laboratory environment in terms of the kind of foods that they eat, the amount of water that they drink, and of course, the kind of temperature that they're kept in. So the conditions can be kept absolutely the same, yet they will differ in things like body weight, even though the genetics of those mice are exactly the same. It is the epigenetic phenomenon that causes changes such as body weight. Another example would be comparing a maggot with a fly. A maggot and a fly have exactly the same genetic code, the A, T, C, and G, and the order in which it occurs in is exactly the same. And, and I mean, it must be the same. It's not like a maggot then acquires a new set of genes. It does not. It's exactly the same, yet they look completely and utterly different. Now, if I was to take uh, uh, some DNA from a human biological male and another human biological female without knowing that they're either male or females, I would be able to tell just by looking at their DNA. And the reason for that is, is because as humans, our genetics, oh, sorry, our biological gender is defined by whether we have an XY chromosome or an XX chromosome, with an XY being a biological male and an XX being biological female. But the crocodiles does not work like that. In fact, when they hatch eggs, their eggs, depending on the type of temperature it grows, in, it dictates whether it's going to be a male crocodile or a female crocodile. For example, uh, if, if, if the eggs grow at a temperature around 34 degrees Celsius, it is going to be a male. If it grows at a slightly lower temperature at 30 degrees Celsius, it is going to be a female. So the genetic code of crocodiles between males and females is actually exactly the same. There are other factors that play a big role that decides what gender, biological gender, the crocodile should be. So in essence, epigenetics is essentially where genetic identity does not equal to phenotypic identity. And essentially what that means is that the two things, the two species, the two organisms have the same genetic code in the same order, yet they look completely different on the outside. And that, in essence, is one way of telling what epigenetics is. Now, there's about 150 of us on this call, and we are a masterpiece of epigenetics. We, each one of us essentially have come from just one single cell, and now we are composed of some 70 trillion cells. Uh, and just to give you how big and enormous and complicated this number is, if I was to take one of you and dissolve you into single cells, and I ask another of you to go and count each of those cells per second, it would take you about one and a half million years to get that caffeine hit if you were to go and have a coffee afterwards. So we're dealing with a huge amount of information. And in fact, we are about 99.9% .9 the same. Uh, but according to research studies, to be precise, we are about 99.8% exactly genetically identical. Yet, as we can see, we're all very different, have different behaviors, our structures are different, and that is largely due to epigenetics. Now, all cells in our bodies contain the same DNA. So whether you were to take a cell from the brain, the skin cell, the liver cell, and look at their genetic code and the order of the genetic code, it would be exactly the same. Yet, we have 200 different types of cells, all very distinct and specialized. And that is because of the epigenetics of those cells are completely different to each other. Not only do these, not only are these cells different, but the epigenetics also ensures that the cells actually stay the same throughout. This is why we don't have, for example, teeth growing in our eyes, because our teeth cells knows to stay as teeth cells, and our eye cells knows to stay as eye cells. And that is because of those epigenetic changes that dictates that cells, that, that cells should stay the same as it should be. But how is this possible? How can a single DNA code for multiple outcomes? Well, because DNA is a script and not a template. 
different cells and organism have to use the same script in different ways. And a nice way to show you this is to think about the movie or the play called Romeo and Juliet. These two different movies were um, were acted out 60 years apart, but the script of the movie is exactly the same. It's just the outward, the directors, the actors and actresses, the lightning, the whole play essentially changes, but not the foundation, not the blueprint. It does not change. So the DNA essentially is a script, but what happens to the DNA changes. There could be changes on top of DNA. And that is what epigenetics is all about. So I've told you a lot about what epigenetics is without actually explaining what epigenetics is. So epigenetics refers to changes in the DNA code that are not caused by changes in DNA sequence. It sounds a bit confusing, but essentially what it means is that the alpha, the, 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 the nucleotides, the A, T, C, and G does not change, but what happens on top of the DNA changes. So imagine you have, um, a book that you're reading, you're reading it letter by letter. You cannot change the letters of the words in the book, but you can add post-it notes of different colors, and those can mean different things. And in fact, the word epigenetic literally means in addition to changes in the genetic sequence. So they're not um, a, a systematic change. It's their addition, uh, there are additional changes to uh, the, the the DNA sequence. It's an it's an Greek word which means on top of or on. In other words, on genetic changes rather than actual inheritable changes to uh, to the DNA sequence itself. So how does a DNA actually look like? So the DNA in our body does not exist in linear stringy molecules. If you look under the microscope, it actually looks something like this. It's really wound up because there's so much information that has to be stored in each cell. And as we said, about 3.2 billion of those letters. If you had it in a linear stringy molecule, it actually wouldn't fit in the size of the cells. So it has to find a way to actually have a really large surface area. And the way it does this is that it wounds itself around certain proteins, as you will see. This is, so essentially this is how it looks like, but in our body without uh, the colors, these wonderful colors that we see. So just to give you a, a bit more of a complicated picture, essentially the DNA is a double-stranded molecules. And as we said, it's not a long linear stringy molecule. It actually wraps around these brown proteins called histones. These brown proteins, there are eight in numbers. So you have one, two, three, four, and there's four at the bottom with tails sticking out. And essentially, the DNA wraps around these um, histone molecules thousands and thousands of times, condensing the DNA, uh, the, the DNA, and therefore fitting in our cells. Now, if I told you that this uh, picture, this picture that we are seeing on this slide, has taken decades of research and millions of pounds uh, of investigation to come up with this kind of complete picture that we are seeing. But this morning, I tried to recreate this model in, uh, in, a, in a kind of a comical fashion with confectionery bought from Sainsbury's. So what I did essentially is bought some jelly tots, some marshmallows and strawberry laces and cocktails to represent um, uh, the, the, the structure of DNA and the epigenetic changes. So I hope that will make it much more clear as to what I'm trying to say to you in terms of epigenetics. And this is what I came up with. So these marshmallows represents those eight histones that I was talking about. And these DNA laces as shown in red represents the DNA sequence. We can see that the DNA sequence is wrapped around, I don't know if I've done a good job, but it's wrapped around the histone molecules, the histone proteins with tails sticking out shown by the cocktail sticks. And these uh, yellow um, jelly tots represent epigenetic changes. And as you, we've told you before, these epigenetic changes are on top of the DNA rather than directly on the DNA uh, code. And essentially, these changes are really, really important in health and disease. The type or the color of epigenetic change 
because there could be many of them, the type or color of epigenetic changes could have a defining impact on health and disease. So in this case, these yellow jelly tots or these yellow epigenetic changes have condensed the chromosome and they have an impact on health and disease such as cancer, uh, diabetes, heart diseases, neurological diseases, and so on and so forth. You can have different types of these epigenetic changes and this time I represented them by showing them to you in green jelly tots. We saw in the previous slide that the um, that the marshmallows were closed up together. These je these green jelly tots instead, or these green epigenetic modifications, what they do is that they loosen out the DNA, and they again have an important role in disease and health, and such as cancer or Alzheimer's disease, and so on and so forth. Now, epigenetic changes are not just important in health and disease, but also things like trauma. And this was shown in a wonderful experiment that was conducted by a, a group of wonderful scientists. What they did is that they took some mice. I'm sorry if you are very fond of mice. They come up in this, um, in this, in this talk, but not in a very nice way. What you see here is a, is a mice. And what the scientists did is that they exposed these mice to the beautiful smell of cherry blossom. And when they did that, they followed it up with some mild electric shock to these mice. And of course, as you would expect with any animal, including us, if you were to receive an electric shock, you would shake in fear. And they did this over and over again in a typical conditioning experiment. What they then did, what they then did is took these scared, timid mice and bred them with other new mice. The next generation came in and then they exposed them only to the smell of cherry blossom without actually giving them any electric shock. The mice still shook in fear. And what this group found out is that trauma is passed on from generation to generation and that epigenetic changes are actually responsible for passing this trauma on. It's a fascinating uh, experiment that gives a lot of um, um, information on various neurological uh, and psychological issues as well. So epigenetics not only important in sort of wet biology, but also in neurological diseases as well. So in summary, our genetic code is organized in an incredibly complicated manner. We said that it's not a linear stringy molecule. It is really wound around these histone molecules that forms these complicated tertiary structures. And epigenetics play an important role in how this DNA is organized based on those jelly tots or those epigenetic modifications uh, that we touched upon. These epigenetic changes, if they if, as represented by those jelly tots, are very much responsible for which genes should be turned on and turned off. If you have blue eyes, that means that the gene for the blue eyes is turned on in you, and that is because of epigenetics that you have that blue eye color. And at the moment, there has been a lot of work that is underway to target these epigenetic changes in various diseases. So I hope this gives you sort of a taster of the kind of contemporary topics that we teach our students here in the clinical pharmacology degree. Um, and I hope that you found uh, some of this very interesting. Thank you very much for, your, for listening. Thank you so much for that uh, lecture, Atik. Thank you. And I just wanted to check that we don't, do we have any questions at all for Atik before we move on to our next lecture about um, the, about epigenetics, about the content of the lecture? Colette, do we have, I will give you just a second to have a think um, about that, but Colette, do we have any questions yet in the Q&A about the lecture? Um, at the moment, we do not have any questions regarding the Q&A. I mean, sorry, regarding the presentation. The the, the lecture that we've just had. OK, yeah, well, lecture. no problem. Yeah. Have a have a think um, as we kind of ready ourselves for our next taster lecture, which will be delivered by Selma. Um, so I will. Um, we will just kind of wait for. Selma to put her camera on and share slides.
But as we're just transitioning, if you do have any questions, do put them uh, in the Q&A and we can we can ask just before we start our next lecture. So can I check, is everything OK for Selma? Hello. Hello. Oh, amazing. Hi, OK, I'm just going to, sorry, just bear with me a moment. I'll just offload. Unless if, do, if any questions do come in, just whilst Selma is getting her lecture ready let me know and we will we'll ask those questions okay thank you Hi everyone, so my name is Selma. I'm a pharmacist by background, but also a lecturer here on clinical pharmacology. So I'll just um, share my slides with you and we can get started. Okay, can you all hear me? Yes, I can yes. see you. Oh, amazing. Perfect. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see yes. your screen. Yep. Okay, perfect. Amazing. So, um, Dr. Atik spoke to you a little bit about um, some drugs involved in oncology, and my role is predominantly in research and clinical trials. So, this is also something that feeds into the course very well and very nicely. So um, prior to having a drug that actually works to treat a certain condition, each um, drug essentially has to go through, there's a set process in which to identify compounds, um, which can be useful for treating certain disease states. In order to do that, there is a process, the pre-discovery phase, where you need to understand the condition or the illness that you're treating and the target sites in which you can then further develop the drug that's able to attack these sites. So where can you get um, drug sources? It's, it's all about co different types of compounds. It can come from nature. So you've got plants which can have active ingredients that can be used to manage um, and target certain diseases. Uh, you've got molecules that you can make from scratch using computer modeling. You can have genetically engineered living systems to produce biological molecules. Um, and there's usually so many compounds that are available out there, but you'll just sift through and find the most applicable ones based on the science, the data and the molecular modeling um, or technologies that you've got to help you decide which is most appropriate. Uh, prior to these drugs uh, being developed and released to the population, they have to go through a set of um, extensive testing. You've got in vitro testing, which is basically test tube testing um, using partial living organisms in controlled environments and in vivo testing, which is in living organisms such as animal testing. So animal model selections may be based on set correlation to humans. Um, you have to be mindful. So sometimes you might use mice, but Obviously, there will be a difference in physiology, but we will try to test these on um, animals that are most uh, similar. So what factors um, influence animal selection? Um, you've got the dosage form, the site of activity, the predicted metabolism of drugs, uh, the animal physiology, like I mentioned before. So swine may be selected for dermatological studies and coronary stents and gut enzyme activity, for example. So canines may not be good for some oral dosage because carnivores have a short gastric emptying rate. So that's the rate at which you digest and push, um, like if when you eat and the um, movement of the intestine is a lot slower to push things down. Um, 
other types of animals is like primates, um, transgenic mice, armadillos, and dogs as well, which are used for narcolepsy studies. So the current European legislation demands acute toxicity tests to be carried out on two or more species, of which one must be non-rodent, covering two routes of administration. And the dose taken forward for a human phase one study would be equivalent to one tenth of the lethal dose found in the animal study or animal model. So in the UK, approval by the Medicine and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, also known as MHRA, is required before any testing in humans can occur. OK, so the company will basically um, require an application form which will then be reviewed by medical and scientific experts to decide whether they've got sufficient um, pre preliminary research. So that's your in vivo, in vitro research. And your um, when you source the compound, the kind of molecular modeling that you use to show that it would work. And of course, uh, your lab testing results and to see whether actually it is safe to go ahead for human testing. Right, and then we get to the human testing, which is split into four phases. We start off with something known as phase one, which is predominantly pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic um, assessment of the drug. This is particularly a heavy area uh, within the course, actually. So you need to know, you want to know, um, you know, how, what the body does to the drug and what the drug does to the body. So this is predominantly done in healthy volunteers or oncology patients because oncology patients tend to be very ill and they might have exhausted all the available options out there. So, you know, they have no choice but to be enrolled onto a, a clinical trial. Uh, you want to use either single um, doses, you want to trial multiple doses, or whether you want to trial them um, you know, using higher doses for a particular agent, you'd usually trial this on about 20 to 100 subjects. Um, and it's designed basically to minimize the risk and find the maximum tolerated dose with limited side effects. And you would study the pharmacokinetic parameters, which is basically how the drug is absorbed into the body, how it's distributed around the body. Does it sit in the blood? Does it go into your tissues, um, into your organs? And you want, want to know how you get rid of it. Do you get rid of it through urine or through feces? These are all important information that you would try to obtain about the drug during this phase study, um, phase one study in you know healthy volunteers. But <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I do have a cough as well. But you also want to look at the pharmacodynamic aspect, which is um, how the body behaves towards the drug. Does the body change the drug? Does it make it inactive? So, um, yeah, so you'd study those that information on healthy volunteers and you might get an early indication as well, um, whether it's efficacious or not. So approximately half of the compounds do move on and make it through, through to phase two testing. But if a drug is deemed unsafe, um, it will be stopped at this phase one. But the majority will half, approximately half, do actually move on and end up being deemed safe. And then you can trial it on a much bigger cohort of patients. So when it comes to designing a study for a phase one trial, um, you would try to you could either look at dose escalation so maybe a try a drug you know has been uh, considered safe and effective for a particular disease state at a dose of 10 milligram let's say but then you might want to trial it what it does at 20. So um or you would start off quite slow with a novel drug and then you'd start slowly sort of test that see how it goes and it might consider increasing it. Now normally you would double the dose until you start to see any effects and um, the dose and um see the effects then dose increments were more carefully controlled so you would go really really slow you may see patients um, dose level groups increase to three patients so what normally tends to happen is the dose is not increased until a defined period of time passed after third patient so once you've done your third patient and you've tested it for a finite amount of time you can then assess the PK, the pharmacokinetics, the pharmacodynamics and the toxicology data. 
If there is toxicity seen in one of the three patients, then the group is expanded at that level to further the, to for further three patients to see the safety on a bigger cohort of patients. OK, and then if obviously a second patient is seen to suffer toxicity within that cohort, then it is defined as the maximum tolerated dose. And that's how you determine what is a effective dose, um, what's a toxic dose and what's the maximum that can be tolerated. OK, so based on the data that you obtain during your phase one, um, you know, in, you might have to go back to the lab to make some changes. Um, you've got compounds that may be tweaked based on these results. You might have to change the labeling of a drug. So, for example, you might think um, over time you might see that it can be actually stored at lower temperatures or higher temperatures. So it could go from the fridge to room temperature or it could usually be stored in the freezer, but we can start storing it in the fridge because it's, so, it's shown stability because you continue to assess the drug, although it's uh, being trialed on patients. It doesn't mean that you stop assessing those um, uh, the, the, the scientific aspects of the drugs, the stability and the efficacy and safety. And of course, once you're happy with that, you go to phase two. So phase two is the probable predicted target patient group um, disease. So, for example, you've tested it on healthy volunteers now. You know that it's uh, you've picked a dose that you think is maximum tolerated dose. Um, and it's relatively safe for these patients. Now you test this dose on patients that have your disease that you are trying to investigate on. So whether it's diabetes, it's heart failure, liver disease. So you start them by testing it on patients with the disease in question. You would normally go for 100 to about 500 patients. And you would use the dose level for phase two will be equivalent to that to phase one. And uh, the trial is then designed to kind of optimize the dose and the treatment schedule and collect as much data as possible on that on that particular dosing regimen, the schedule and, it, you know, what are the outcomes? So most drugs will tend to fail at phase two. Um, because some can turn out to be ineffective or patients may not actually tolerate them, especially with patients that have that disease state might end up getting worse. Um, so not all drugs actually do go on to make it to the phase three. So phase three is the largest cohort that you'll be testing your drug on. So these are much uh, bigger studies. It's about 1,000 to 5,000 patients, and they tend to be randomized and randomized controlled trials. So basically, you would have patients that are receiving this drug, um, and you might have a comparator. So it could be placebo, which is uh, patients receiving a dummy drug. So they think they may not be aware that whether they're receiving the actual drug in question or whether it's just a dummy tablet that pretends to be that drug, but actually it's just got lactose and a bit of sugar. Um, but you'll always have a comparator or it could be your drug that's in question, um, comparing it to a drug that's already out on the market to see, you know, is it better or is it actually worse? So, yeah, you would compare it against the current best standard or against um, an inert drug, also known as a placebo. And then that data that you get, it usually is over a large population over a prolonged period of time. And you should be able to get sufficient data about the safety, the efficacy and get an overall risk benefit ratio and assessment. 10% of trials do fail at this stage. OK, so once you've passed the phase three and um, you're very happy with your drug, you then go on to try and get marketing authorization. So for those drugs that make it, um, you would apply to the MHRA um, to get approval. Uh, however, in the UK, there is an additional step. You have to overcome NICE as well. Um, so NICE is the national um, guidelines that are advised um, for all healthcare professionals where drugs are deemed to be cost effective. So not only are they actually effective in managing their conditions, but they're also quite um, beneficial in terms of their cost. They're not very expensive and you can probably treat more people with a um, set number of, of uh, funding that you may have. Um, so yeah, you'd get MHRA approval, you'd have to overcome the NICE and get NICE approval. And then 
you would continue the pharmacovigilance aspect. So, for example, a prime example is the COVID trial, I mean, the COVID vaccines. Um, now that everyone's had COVID vaccines, they are still in the pharmacovigilance um, phase where we're still kind of uh, obtaining information about the response to those. So any side effect profile, any long term issues. Um, and of course, you know, this will vary from drug to drug, but you will always continue to assess uh, the outcome once they're released to the public. Right which I kind of touched upon um, earlier, the phase four, which is the pharmacovigilance, also known as post-marketing. And then once again, it's pretty much just gathering safety information. Rare side effects um, are those that tend to occur one in 10,000 people. Um, and they may only become apparent once the medicine is in general use because you may not see this in the phase three. And we have something called the yellow card scheme. Um, which is where healthcare professionals report um, unknown side effects of a particular drug. So because it's gone through its clinical trial, you've managed to deduce all the possible side effects of that drug. However, um, when it goes out to the general uh, population, you know, you may get the odd uh, response that may have not been observed. So we have to do something known as a yellow card, um, fill out as much detail as possible, um, and send it to the relevant uh, company and MHRA, and then they could add that onto the list and be more aware of it and assess, reassess the safety of that drug. Okay, so once all of that is done and you've got a new medicine that has now got approval and has been licensed, whether that's used in cancer, used in heart disease, kidney disease, liver disease, um, in order to sort of eliminate um, any uh, postcode lottery and have a divide between obviously those that can afford healthcare and those that cannot. We have something known as NICE um, guidance or the SMC for the Scottish Medicine Consortium. Um, and these look at, you know, once uh, referring once again back to the cost effectiveness, something that is not too expensive and you're able to treat a vast number of patients and yet have um, optimal outcomes for those patients and benefits. Um, and the NHS, again, is legally obliged to fund medicine recommended by NICE. So anything that's recommended by NICE, we should be in a position to fund that um, as part of the NHS. Right, so once that's all done, it's still not the end. So clinical trials will continue after the medicine, ha um, medicine has been granted a licence and it will um, aim to find new treatment uses or compare a new medicine to other treatments or determine the effectiveness in a much wider range of patients and assess the long-term benefits and safety, which we've touched upon in a pharmacovigilance. And sometimes you can have a licensed med for a, um, a pre-existing condition that can be used for a condition that hasn't yet been uh, you know, a license for it has for another condition that hasn't yet been, you know, aware, uh, people have not yet been aware of it. So other than that, really, that's pretty much sums up um, clinical trials. Um, do you guys have any questions for me? Sorry, it was a bit difficult, me coughing. But yes, do you have any questions for me? Thank you so much for that, Selma. I think we do have some questions that have come in. Colette, do you have questions for Selma ready? Yes, there's some questions here. Great. Um, yeah, there's some questions here. I've got one here. It says, in this course, would you learn or need to be um, to be acutely aware about the ethics of using animals for creating drugs? Yeah, in this course, we do touch upon, yes, the ethics. Um, uh, revolving around the use of animals. Um, we are shifting away as much as possible, but of course there has to be some, uh, you know, understanding that you can't just test drugs directly on on humans because obviously um, cruelty to animals. But yeah, there is that we do go into detail and we do discuss that. And um, some people actually have the opportunity to do placements in um, pharma companies or in hospitals to actually see clinical trials happening in action as well. Thank you. That was the main one for yourself. There was a few um, that came after for Atik. I don't know if we can do them now. Yeah, or... he's still here. Yep, I'll grab him. Yeah. Just one moment. <laughs> Okay. 
use that slide. Perfect, thank you. Sorry, we've had some IT issues, so we have to work from one computer. No worries at all. Thank you. Just a few questions for you. They kind of came in afterwards when she started sure. the presentation. So I'll just start um, from the first few questions. So it says, so with epigen epigenet epigenetics, the DNA is the same, ACTG, but the genes get turned off or on slash on. Yes, that is absolutely right. So as we said, the actual sequence of the DNA, as we said, the A, T, C and G actually remains exactly the same. But what happens to that sequence changes. And that is because of those epigenetic modifications that allow those changes to, to happen. And I depicted that by using those jelly tots. So different colors of those jelly tots would activate a certain response. I hope that answers the question. Thank you for that. Okay, the next question is, all, are all diseases caused by epigenetic changes or just inherited ones? So that's a very, very good question. Um, and I would say no, not all diseases are caused by epigenetics. Actually, a lot of these diseases have a very large genetic component to it as well, especially if we talk about in terms of cancer. Cancer is fundamentally a, a genetic disorder, but these epigenetic changes also play a role in it. Um, and it's epigenetics is a relatively new field, and we're starting to find out more and more information uh, about epigenetic phenomenon in various conditions. So uh, yes, it, it's, it, it's, it essentially works both ways. It's a combination of epigenetic changes and genetic changes that would cause certain types of diseases. Thank you. Um, I don't know if you want to continue with the questions, um, Kirsty, or do you? So do we have any further questions on the lectures? Yes, we do. Yes, <laughs> oh, we We've do. Got quite a few. Oh. <laughs> okay, yes. I wonder if, if just because we um, are, are running out of time a little bit and we do want to hear from our students, our student ambassadors studying the course, I wonder if there is a way um, for Atik and Selma to see the Q&A questions, if you could guide, uh, support them to maybe answer the questions directly um, yeah. so that people can still get some answers, but we can just hear from our student ambassadors as well. So whilst we're hopefully answering some of your questions on the lectures, we're just going to move now to hear from some of our students who are studying clinical pharmacology with, with us at St George's. So we have Diana and Benjamin on the call this evening. If you could both turn on your cameras now, please. And Selma, if you could stop sharing your screen as well. Hi both. Hello, thank you for joining us for the session this evening. And lots of us on the call this evening to kind of um, find out more about what it's really like to study clinical pharmacology. And I've got a couple of questions to kick us off, but then I will go to Colette to kind of feed through any questions that you might have. Please do put them in the Q&A because we want this session to be as useful as possible for you. Um, but it would be great if you could just introduce yourselves first and then I'll start with my first question. Um, Benjamin, would you like to go first? Uh, sure. Um, thanks very much. Um, hi, guys. Hi to everyone on this call. Um, my name is Benjamin. I'm a second year clinical pharmacology student right now. So um, I started the course back in uh, 2021. Um, I went. I was in um, year 13 at the time and I'm one of I was one of the uh, year groups that was affected by the pandemic. And um, so I'm going to be graduating in 2026. Okay, great. Thank you for that, Benjamin. And Diana? Thank you, Kirsty. My name is Diana. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm in my third and final year of studying clinical pharmacology, so I will be graduating this year. And like Benjamin, I was affected by the pandemic too, but that didn't stop us from pursuing what we do on this course. So I'm happy to answer your questions that follow. Okay, fantastic. And I might start with you, Diana, um, just to, to start us off with our questions, um, to ask you why you chose to study clinical pharmacology at St George's. So initially, I intended on going on to medicine after this course, because I thought that this course would provide me like, with the foundations of pharmacology, and I thought it would help me with studying medicine in the future. But now that I've 
been through like three years of this course, I've completely changed my mind. I've seen more opportunities. So I can go down research, clinical trials or pharmaceutical companies. So there's something for everyone, really. OK, great. And what about you, Benjamin? Why did you choose this course? Um, actually, I'm my um, res response is quite similar to Diana. I initially wanted to do medicine as well back in um, year 13. And I was really set on doing medicine. Like I was I was a diehard person that I said I'm going to do medicine and medicine was the only thing I was going to do. So um, when it, um, so I originally applied for biomed, so um, I didn't get the grades that I wanted. So I ended up uh, doing a clinical farm which was actually one of the best decisions I've made because over the time I've actually really enjoyed my time here doing this course. Um, I've, I initially wanted to use uh, Clean Farm as like my building block and to apply to postgrad med, but over my time doing during this course, it really changed my perspective and it taught me a lot of things that you can, a lot of careers that you can do rather outside of the medical profession. Um, and what I like with this course is that it's very, um, it gives you a lot of, um, it's similar to medicine, but it's not exactly medicine. So it's, we do touch quite a lot on them diseases, but we do it in a different way where we focus more on the far, ph the pharmacology behind it rather. So um, this course gave me um, a lot of uh, uh, variability in terms of careers, which is quite similar to what Diana said. So that's why I did choose this and I'm really enjoying it. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. I think it's it's always helpful for people to learn a little bit about the journey that um, people go on to kind of find the subject for them. I'm aware that because we are a little bit short of time, it would be great to hear if anybody does have any questions kind of from um, the audience who have joined us this evening. So Colette, do we have any questions that have come through yet in the Q&A for Benjamin and Deanna? Um, so far, I believe there's just one question that may that may be they may be able to answer so it's regarding mm -hmm. um and jobs job prospects for st after studying this so um i think benjamin just mentioned he 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 knows there's a few job prospects so if benjamin if you can answer that question if you've researched that and you know exactly what type of jobs you'll be able to achieve um to you know, to get into after this course Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so one of the um, job prospects you can go into is into clinical trials. So you could work um, with drug companies. So, for example, Pfizer or AstraZeneca, if you guys are aware of that, um, they were um, the examples of drug companies that were important in the development of uh, the COVID vaccination. And they were quite um, important in the rollout of the vaccines. So um, with this degree, I know that you can go into, for example, working in drug in a clinical in a clinical setting where you help to develop a new drug um, you make sure that it's tested safely within the population um, you would work with um, drug companies to make sure that um, you gain enough evidence for the safety and for the development of the the drug um, also as well just aside from um, going into job careers you could also go back into studying so you could use clinical pharmacology to maybe pursue um, a postgraduate or a master's. Um, I know one career that's quite uh, spoken about is um, 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 you could go maybe into doing postgraduate medicine or you could um, maybe pursue a career maybe into public health. So there is quite um, a lot of variability. It just depends on um, what, what you're interested really. Thank you very much for that, Benjamin. Um, I think another question towards the students are how much of the course is independent study and how much is lecture? So I don't know if you want to, um, Diana, if you want to answer that for us, please. Yeah, so a typical week is usually we have two days on site. So we'll have interactive lectures, so group work. So we'll look at a case study and kind of work as a group to go through it. And then the other two days will be self-study so maybe some online lectures and some time to just read over papers and really understand the content and there's a day in the middle where we have time off to go and do societies and kind of join clubs so there's quite an equal balance between studying and outside activities if that answers the question 
And yeah, thank you very much for that, Diana. Yeah, I think that's the most questions directly to yourself. Um, Kirsty, how are we doing with time? We have a couple of minutes left. I might finish at 18.02 as we started a little bit late. I'm sorry that we went over and I'm sorry that we did start a little bit late, but just so we can squeeze in one more question and then we will talk to you about next steps if you're interested in finding out a little bit more about studying clinical pharmacology at St George's. Um, Deanna, you've just touched upon this um, a little bit, but it would be great just before we kind of move on and, and finish the session to hear a little bit more about anything else that you've been involved with at St George's outside of your courses. Um, I'm not sure who would like to take that one, really, but anything else you've been involved in, societies or anything? So I have been involved in like work within the university. So we have a programme called ERA. So that looks to bring equality in academia. So we'll take on a two-week placement where we'll shadow a researcher or a professor in whatever niche you want to experience. And we'll kind of get an insight into research, cutting edge science. So it really kind of blends in with the course if you're really interested in research. That's one option. Um, I've also been part of um, the show. So we had the Diwali show which runs every year as part of a charity show. And there's opportunities for singing, dancing, backstage. Yeah, you name it. Oh, amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that, Deanna. Benjamin, do you have anything you'd like to kind of share, other things you've been involved with? Oh, yeah. Um, so one of the key things that I've uh, really been involved in this year is um, it's mostly with the course, to be honest. So at the moment, I'm mm. the course representative for year two. Um, my with our year group, um, I've, I was actually in Deanna's year. I was in year three, but I took a gap year during my studies. So um, okay. I I told um, I, I ran for a course rep because I wanted to represent there's a proportion of us where we've just joined the from year three, moved to year two, where it was quite at the start a weird transition for us. So um, my work involved with um, just helping the the um, the newly transition from the year three to year two to try to adjust into the new cohort um, as well just make just uh, providing feedback as well to the course uh, the course team and just attending some of their meetings as well and meeting with the course reps as well of, of that current year so a lot of my, my time in university has really just been revolved around the clean farm if i'm honest um, as well i've done other societies as well so i have done the um one ten, one of the societies i joined was the tennis society um there's also um a lot of societies here that I would recommend joining. Um, it just depends on you and on your timetable because it is quite. It can be tricky to manage quite a lot of societies and to have your course on top because it is a. It is quite demanding, Clean Farm. Absolutely yes. Um, thank you for for sharing that and all, all the opportunities, as you say, the ways to contribute to the development of your course and student voice and feeding that into the experience. And and so thank you for sharing that as well. So I did say, did I say we finish at 18.02 or 18.03? I think we should probably finish at 18.02 so as we're a little bit over. Thank you everyone for joining us for this session this evening um, to learn more about studying clinical pharmacology, um, to develop your understanding of the subject area and what it might like, be like to study here at St George's. If you would like to find out more, uh, we have a sciences open evening coming up this Thursday. Uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. on site and Colette will actually post the link, the registration link to that event in the chat so you can sign up for that there and we um, we will also email to invite you to attend that as well if you'd like the opportunity to really kind of visit site and, and, and meet the course teams and see the spaces that our students learn in and um, we also have, uh, I would recommend that you check out our website for full details of the entry requirements for the course. This course does um, close on UCAS on the 31st of January. So do check that out if you're interested potentially in studying in 2024. And if you have further questions, if you're reflecting um, or after the session, please do get in touch. You can get in touch with us um, on study at sgul.ac.uk and a member of 
our course inquiries team will come back to you. Um, so thank you so much again for joining the call. We hope that it's been useful. We'll send out a survey to, to get some feedback um, and wishing everyone um, a pleasant rest of the evening. Um, and thanks again for coming.